Hello and welcome to The Strange Brew. My name's Jason Barnard and that was Gordon Giltrap and Lucifer's Cage. What we'll be doing today is going through uh, Gordon's fantastic career, Gordon being one of the preeminent guitarists of his generation. We started off with Lucifer's Cage because actually in terms of um, Gordon's career, that was something that he originally wrote quite early on. Uh, but firstly, a huge welcome, Gordon. Good evening or good day, whatever day whatever day you wanted to be, sir. <laughs> Before we get into Lucifer's Cage, was it rock and roll that got you into music or was it other aspects? Well, I guess it would be because I didn't think of it as rock and roll, but what um, really turned me on to the guitar was really Hank Marvin and the Shadows. They were a big influence, but in the early days I used to love the, uh, the Everly Brothers and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I suppose it was early rock and roll. I was never a Presley fan, but um, I liked the Everly's, I loved the harmonies. And uh, that's what kind of got me into playing the guitar. But mainly the, mainly Hank Marvin of The Shadows was the first real right. 
British guitar hero. And then as we got into the, the mid-60s, you kind of bit more onto the blues and uh, folk circuit, is that right? It was, really, yeah. I think what fascinated me about picking up an acoustic guitar was it was so complete and self-sufficient. It was a, like a complete orchestra and you could just take it around in a case. And you didn't have to worry about working with bass players and drummers and egos and all that. And that fascinated me, the idea that one could be complete, just one man, one guitar and one voice. In those days, I say with the one voice, that was the time of the singer-songwriter. And the album that really changed my life was the very first album released by Bert Jansch Ah. on Transatlantic Records way back in 1965. It was his first album. And it's a work of genius. It just changed my life. And the, the lives of many guitar players at that time, we kind of became obsessed with what Bert was all about, this kind of man of mystery, you know. And what Bert did, it showed me that what the possibilities of what could be done with just one guitar. And it was mind-blowing. It was just ex- extraordinary, really. You mentioned Transatlantic. Your first label was Transatlantic, wasn't it? Yes, it was. I did two albums for Transatlantic, both produced by the legendary Bill Laid leader, and then I did an album in 1971 for MCA Records called A Testament of Time. Yeah. 73 was an album with Phonogram just called Gill Trap. That was like, those albums were a mixture of songs and instrumentals. And up until that time, I really thought I was a songwriter and yeah. I really thought I could sing. It's only in hindsight I realized that that really wasn't my strong point. And a man called Peter Robinson, who worked for the label at the po- at the time, pointed out that my strengths were my guitar playing. Yeah. I was a bit affronted by that because I liked my songs. I thought they were good. And the instrumentals I was writing that time were their kind of, they were kind of fillers, if you like, in between the vocals. And I didn't have any problems writing tunes. They just sort of flowed out of me. But when he said that, I thought, you know, I think he's right. And that's when I decided to pursue an instrumental direction. And the end result, was the visionary album that came out in 1976 that was a a game changer for me and I think uh, for a lot of people in actual fact although I didn't realize until afterwards the impact that how the album had on people because you don't know you just do what you you do your best you don't know you don't know whether you're breaking boundaries or how you're touching people's lives you just do what's intuitively within you and that uh, that was the start of it 76 really with visionary we opened with Lucifer's Cage and despite it Coming from that era where you were kind of a bit more of a traditional singer-songwriter, that is a, a song that has remained with you and, and you've come back to and it's something that people will still associate with you. Do you recall writing that song and how that came to you? I do, yeah. I was, I think I was 19 when I wrote that. I was very much influenced by so many were in those days with drones and Indian music and a lot of people were were kind of going in that direction. John Martin was, Al Stewart, certainly Bert Jansch was in terms of uh, the work he did on the Jack Orion album, which was traditional, but, you know, using using that kind of drone sound that you can get with open tunings on guitars. It's almost like a sitar sound, you know? Yeah. I think what Bill Lee didn't, dis- well, he didn't discover it, but he knew what I was all about, that basically I was never a folk musician. I was really a rock musician taking in all these influences because my other big influence was Pete Townsend. Yeah. Uh, And I think when I was writing Lucifer's Cage, I think that Townsend influence was subliminally there within me. But I do remember writing it and the title, I thought, now, how did that come about? It came about because I was very much involved with the... I guess the Christian movement in the early in the early seventies, the Festival of Light, a lot of people were becoming born again Christians. I was part of that movement, if you like, and uh, that influenced. Them. So what I was trying to get across was an anti-satanic piece. It was Lucifer, but Lucifer was going to be caged, was going to be imprisoned, if you like, and that's how that image came about. Lucifer's cage. You mentioned Visionary. Other tracks on there work really well, like Awakening. And in terms of the concept for that album, there was a link to William Blake. It was. I'd grown up with Blake, but I didn't realise it because the, the wonderful hymn Jerusalem was a favourite of my mother's. And I think it's a favourite of a lot of people. Yeah. And I didn't realise at the time until I, I saw a Sunday Times colour supplement on William Blake because the Tate Gallery was doing an exhibition of Blake's work. And I was totally blown away by the paintings 
and then later on the poems and the whole essence of the man just appealed to me because he, he was an exceptional human being he was a prophet he was a visionary he was a great artist and he was um, a rebel he did rebel against the constrictions of the church at that time and i liked that and i really took the blake and i felt i don't know i was so intense about the whole blake concept that i felt at times i was almost channeling him you know i know it sounds a bit highfalutin but yeah. i really thought i'd grasped the spirit of the man and i think a lot of that hopefully came out in the music but the interesting thing about visionary because most of the pieces were written and recorded on a home tape recorder. You know, the opening track starts with the ticking of a clock. It sounds like a clock. In actual fact, it's a wooden metronome. Uh. When I was doing my demos for Visionary, I, I had the metronome going literally to keep time. And my producer said, we love that. The track's going to open with the metronome. <laughs> and my God, doesn't it work? Oh, yeah. Does it not work fabulously well? Yeah. And that's how that came about. I think the whole thing, like all the, the work that I've done subsequently, that I believe is my best work kind of grew organically. You know, and I think Visionary did. That just poured out of me, really. And around this period, you assembled some of the best musicians in the industry. People like Simon Phillips, John Perry, Johnny Gustafsson, Rick Sanders of Fairport, Clive Bunker, Jeff Rattle. How did that work, gathering such a... I've only covered a few of them. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't take credit for the, the early days of Visionary because initially my producer said, who would you like playing drums on this? And I was a huge fan of Yes and Bill Bruford. Yeah. I said, I'd love Bill Bruford. But of course, you couldn't get Bill because he was touring the world with Yes. They said, well, we've got this other drummer. He's really good. He's only, I think he was 18. Yeah. And they brought in Simon Phillips. And of course, when he started playing, I realized I was in the presence of genius. And then you got that. You got that wonderful sensitivity of John G. Perry on bass. And I'd known John because I toured, I became friends with John when he was in Caravan. But um, he was already on the on the scene doing sessions. So really, it was down to the producers. They found these people. I didn't. And even to the point of John Gustafsson, I didn't find John. They found him. He was looking for a gig. He was, he was in Roxy Music for a time, and then he worked with uh, Ian Gillen. Yeah. 
and he was looking for a gig and the gig came up and he became my my bass player so i didn't choose him so i can't take credit for a lot of that now rick sanders is a different story because rick's an old friend of mine and um, i've always loved his playing and i wanted that folk element on the peacock party album so i can take credit for that clive bunker was an old friend of john perry's they were in a band called quantum jump and uh when Heart Song started getting into the charts and a tour was assembled, I had the pick of the best in the business. So I was very fortunate, very fortunate. It's only when I look back now, in retrospect, I realized how fortunate I was because I was surrounded by people who knew what they were doing. And I remember chatting with uh, my dear friend Pete Townsend a year or so back, and I didn't know until relatively recently what the admirer of Pete is of my work. I had no idea. No idea at all, because he was one of my heroes. And he said to me, he said, uh, you were working with people. He said they knew what they were doing. And they did, because Triumvirate was, was uh, Rod Edwards and Roger Hand. They were, they were a songwriting duo, and they were produced by George Martin. Yeah. So they spent a lot of time in the studio with George Martin, picking up a lot of his techniques. If you like, I had a direct conduit to the Beatles with those guys. And they brought all that to the table in terms of recording. And that's why those albums sound so fantastic. You know, we weren't recorded at Abbey Road, but we didn't need to. We're down recorders, sadly no longer there. It was an outstanding studio. by had some great sound engineers. Gareth Edwards, who was uh, Roger's younger brother, sadly no longer with us. And also Roger Wake, great sound engineer, sadly no longer with us. So, yeah, it's all circumstantial. And if you can just be at the right place at the right time then it happens the great Vaughan Williams was once asked how he would define genius mm. he said genius is the right man in the right place <laughs> at the right time so if people regard me as a genius which they have from time to time and I think that's really lovely doesn't mean you're clever it just means you've got a gift and I thought yeah I was in the right place I was the right man in the right place at the right time at that time to produce those seminal albums and of course you'd you don't realise that you're breaking ground. You have no idea. You're just doing what's in your heart. It continued with Perilous Journey, which came uh, quite soon after. And am I right that the Deserter song from that album actually featured members of the Average White Band? It did, yeah. That the Deserter, I mean, the whole concept of Perilous Journey was not mine. I just wanted to put out, these, these tunes were just falling out of me, right? Yeah. Every day I would write something and come up with an idea, and it was just a wonderful experience. But they said, look, we need a concept. I said, well, do we have to have a concept? Can't we just put an album of the nice chooses in? No, we've got to have a concept. And they said, we think a good song concept would be a book by Herman Hess called Journey to the East, a very, very powerful spiritual book, actually. It's only recently I've read it. And The Deserter was one of the chapters that came out of the book. And we'd got the initial tracks down. We got the bass and the drums and the guitar and the keyboards. But we just needed a bit of icing on the cake. And they'd work with Roger Ball and Molly Duncan from The Average Whites. They'd used them on sessions. And they just said, look, come down to the studio one evening. And they turned up with their lovely saxophones and they just jammed over the track. Wow. I think it was one, I think it was one take. And they were just sparring off each other. And, of course, the atmosphere on that. And the interesting thing about it is, of course, I'm playing electric guitar, and I never consider myself an electric guitar player, but I think that was a pretty good solo for someone who's, who's essentially, who was essentially uh, an acoustic player, which I still am. I kind of just get away with it playing electric guitar, but I know a lot of people would disagree because it was very effective. And those guys that were producing me were guiding me in the right direction without a shadow of a doubt. And we'll be covering Heart Song a little later, so... Okay. But more generally than that, 1977, such an amazing year for you. you Ivan Novello nominated, uh, Top of the Pops, and a real contrast to the, the music scene that was going on in that time. You know, you had punk, etc., and a lot of artists, including, actually, um, Fairport Convention from a, a folk era, struggled to navigate that late 70s period. What was that like? Well, I think the punk thing came along probably just after, so I kind of... Right. I, you know, I think I managed to sort of bypass that. And I think because of what I was doing, there's always going to be an audience for good musicianship and melody. And if you actually analyse those albums, although the instruments that were used then were of that period, they're still current because the mini Moog is still used 
predominantly in progressive rock, yeah. even today. Um, so really, they, they haven't dated that much because we were marrying real strings and synthesized strings on one album. And I don't think anybody else is doing that. I didn't realize we were breaking ground and, if you like, building bridges between classical music and rock music with those albums. I had no idea. We were just doing it, you know. It didn't affect me at all, I'll be honest with you. It didn't affect any deals I was getting because of well, the music I was making or the gigs. But I think it was affecting the bigger bands because they, they were regarding them as a bit, a little bit kind of pompous and a bit self-indulgent. Mm. I don't think I was that self-indulgent. At least I hope not. Tell us about Fear of the Dark, which is another great album. Well, that all came about they think, in the olden days when you signed with a record company. They'd work with you on three albums. Yeah. The first album would be like a toe in the water, although it was visionary, so that was a good piece of work. And then the second album, you were sort of like move forward. And everything we learned from the first and second album came together with Fear of the Dark. Again, it wasn't particularly a concept album but the music was very dark so i was writing pieces like fear of the dark and inner dream 
those very dark, soul-searching pieces. So it, it made a lot of sense to call the album Fear of the Dark. And then we had the Reflective Sunglasses, which was such a strong, iconic album cover that. Yeah. I knew I'd arrive because it's a gatefold sleeve. I thought, at long last, <laughs> I've arrived. I've got a gatefold sleeve. I thought I was, you know, I thought I cracked it. But yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it's a great album. So even, even now I listen to it, I think, my goodness, it's so good. <laughs> Was it Shirley Roden on, on vocals? Yeah, it was Shirley vocal on Inner Dream. Right. Where well, she's doing that whammy. But because initially, no disrespect to Shirley, because she could do it. She had that range. She had that incredible high range. I wanted Kate Bush. I could hear Kate yeah. Bush on it. But I approached her management, and she had this very, very aggressive manager at the time. We just couldn't get past her. I think if Kate had known about it, she would have done it. I swear to God, she would have done it. She would have loved it.
in the 80s as well, it's worth mentioning um, you were working on library music and, and commissions and themes. Was it natural because Heart Song that was used for the holiday series? Yeah, again, Heart Song was not library music, no. obviously. It wasn't specifically, but of course, it was the one that everybody played and it was used for, for the holiday programme for about eight years. And I think because of that usage, that was the reason why I got nominated for an Ivor Novello Award. I think surely that was giving it real national exposure. Every Sunday night, people would be watching the holiday programme and there was parts. So, of course, it was perfect for it. Yeah. Then a new director came along and uh, stopped using it. Broke my heart, that did. <laughs> <laughs> and also my bank balance, that's for sure. But that led to you working on other things. Was it that producers kind of identifying that you that your original music would work for either film or TV? Yeah, it, it was. And that led on to me doing stuff for um, KPM. You know, as a, I haven't done library music for years now, actually, but it was perfect for it. My music still is perfect for film and television, but for some reason, it hasn't happened. I need to uh, have a meeting with my publisher and... Uh, <laughs> have some strong words because it's just crazy. You know the music as well as I do. Mm. It's the reason why we're talking. As well-versed in my music as anybody. So you know that the potential is there for that kind of stuff. Yeah. And now we do get to Heart Song. And I actually wanted to discuss, because it's been, obviously you've recorded it a few times, the 1993 version of Heart Song, which is, for me, particularly special. But It is, isn't it? yeah. Maybe it's worth exploring the run-up to that. Am I right that you were working on a, a book about the Hofner guitar in, in that period? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I was doing loads of stuff, being a guitar geek. Growing up in the 60s, one couldn't afford American guitars. So the affordable equivalent were Hofners. So my first proper guitar, electric guitar, was a Hofner Veritin. Right. And I used to gaze lovingly and longingly at music shop windows at these beautiful half the guitars, these arch tops. We could never afford one. And then as time went on, they weren't so desirable. And I bought one from a guitar shop in Liverpool, I think, for 350 quid. And I thought, how can I get some information on this? And and there wasn't any. Right. And so I thought, I ought to write a book. And I did, with the help of my friend Neville Martin. So I was doing a lot of that stuff at the time. And uh, with the, the 1993 version of Heart Song, it was just like a celebration. I'm trying to work it out. I think it was like 15 years. Yeah, roughly that. And we thought, well, let's let's hang it on that. And I thought, I'll approach a few people. And of course, they all said yes. Because all my guitar friends, they all love Heart Song. You know, there's something about it that's very appealing. So I had that star-studded lineup. And it's coming out, it's coming out on a four-track vinyl single towards the end of the year i can't tell you much about it yet oh. but it's going to be one of the tracks on it because it's still a well-kept secret you know it's only people like you who are a real die-hard enthusiast to know about it because hmm. you know it's, it's a magnificent track and people don't realize you know the significance of all those stars on their one track it is amazing you've got brian may on his yeah. red special you've got steve howe rick wakeman mm. of course neil murray mid-year as well that's right mid-year and, of course, we kept the original drums with Simon Phillips, kept my original guitar, but the rest of it was uh, pretty much... Oh, we kept the original lovely so uh, fluty-type solo that Eddie Spence wrote yeah. in the middle section, because that's so lovely, that. It was a lovely experience. You look back on it, I think, God, oh, did that really happen?
But in your own right, not only in terms of these musicians playing on on your material, increasingly you have been recognised, so much so that when uh, Guitar Magazine had their 10th anniversary poll, you were second only to uh, Eric Clapton as a guitarist. Yeah, the guitarist poll, that's right, Eric. He was number one, I was number two. The Adrian Legg was number three. I forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me. (laughs) I want to play um, your version of A Misunderstood Man, with Be With Me Always, which is from your Troubadour album, because of your time collaborating with Cliff Richard in uh, Heathcliff. Well, that was lovely, because I'd known Cliff since the early 70s, and we sort of become friends. And uh, when he was putting together Heathcliff, he had this brainwave that he would have Gordon Giltrap as a kind of musical narrator, as a troubadour. So I would appear throughout the show as a kind of musical link between one scene and another, right? Yeah. And that's how it came about. Now, A Misunderstood Man came about because I decided I was going to do a guitar arrangement of it, even before John Farrer had decided what I was going to be playing, because nobody knew what, they didn't know what to do with me, right? Yeah. You know, I went to the rehearsal, but nothing had been written. So I thought, I'll do an arrangement of A Misunderstood Man, because I liked it. I played to John Farrow down the phone. He was in the States. And he went absolutely ape over. He said, that's fantastic. In fact, he used quite a few expletives, which I can't (laughs) say on the air. But um, he said, that'll be the overture. I said, okay. So I opened the show every night with a a slightly stripped down version of a a misunderstood man. Hello, beautiful song. And um, of course, I had uh, Cliff on backing vocals. Very kindly did that when we recorded it. That must have been uh, great being on that show. And I recall reading in uh, Steve Pilkington's uh, biography of you that Cliff had plans to take Heathcliff even further and whatever, and it is just a bit sad that things didn't take off the way they uh, potentially should have done. I know. He he was going to take it to Australia. Yeah. And I was going to go with him. I was the only one of the few people in the car that he was going to take because uh, – you can't replicate me, can you? So, and that, yeah, I forgot about that. But it was a, it was seven months. It was, it was a glorious time for me. I loved every minute of it. Every minute, every night was like the first night, and it was a joy to be on stage with this iconic pop star. You know, this legend, really, to be on stage with him was a real thrill, a real honour.
I've next chosen on Camber Sands a live version from On a Summer's Night. Okay. I wanted to pick that because certainly in the last 20 years, you've really grown your connection with playing live and you've been so deftly choosing material from your career and On Camber Sands seems to be a song that you have come back to on occasion as well. Most definitely, yeah. It's become a perennial favourite. In fact, a friend of mine lost his wife a few years ago and they played at the funeral. So I'm quite big on funerals these days. Mm. So yes, it is a lovely piece. My friend, the singer-songwriter from Hull, Carrie Martin, I want to give her a mention because she's so amazing. It's her favourite piece of mine. And she said, whenever I get stressed, I just put on canvas sand and I just chill out. And the version she likes is the version without the without the Del Newman string arrangement. She loves it, just the guitar version. But it's, it is a, a very evocative piece, and I do enjoy playing it. And it's still a challenge to play it every night. Is that added excitement, that live material? Um, every show it has slight differences. and Yeah. It's the same with, um, with Heart Song. I've, yeah. I've just re- recently revisited Heart Song, and I've changed it around a little bit, and I've kept it fresh, and, and the audience love it. That's not detracting from the piece at all, but it keeps me fresh. It's not that I'm that fed up with it. I love playing it. Every night I play it, it's like a challenge because it's, it demands so much energy. But it's such a joyful piece to play. I love it. You never get tired of playing it. I don't know whether Ralph would tell ever gets fed up with singing the streets <laughs> of London, but I certainly don't get fed up with playing heart song, for sure. Well, just before we get uh, to play your, your version of Camber Sands, you did mention Carrie Martin, and I had heard, I think, her latest album, Evergreen, which is uh, amazing. So a second plug for Carrie Martin anyway. Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you.
as we get more up to date, Gordon, I wanted to cover some of your material with uh, Rick Wakeman. I've chosen The Thinker from Brush and Stone, that album that you made with Rick. How far back had your friendship and partnership with Rick go? It went back pre-93. I'm trying to think. Do you know, I can't remember the first time I met Rick. You know, you know these people. You feel as though you've known them all your life. <laughs> yeah, I think I know what it was. It was a pilot radio show that we put on for BBC Radio Derby. A man called Ashley, Ashley Franklin was putting together a, a whole show. And that's where I met Rick. He played on some of my pieces. But I'm glad you mentioned that track because, as you know, Brush and Stone is... Rick's piano pieces, and I've added my yeah. my work to that. And then he's playing synth on my pieces. Now, I was with Rick about three months ago. We did a concert together in Tewkesbury, along with Oliver Wakeman and Carrie. Right? It, was a, it was a charity concert. And I was chatting with Rick before the show, and I said, Rick, how do you feel about revisiting my track and just our piano? Because I love his piano playing. He said, yeah, great idea, Gordon. So he's promised me he's going to do it. Whether it happens or not, I don't know. I maybe need to chip him up. And then we're going to re-release it because it's a magnificent album. Yeah. And I spent nearly five months working on his track. Gosh. And they are as near damn perfect as I could possibly do. I'm so pleased with it. And I'm ever so glad you, you've chosen one of his piano pieces because they're all wonderful. And the interplay between he and I on those tracks is just great memories for me. Great memories. Mm.
wanted to finish off with a few tracks that you've done in more recent years with Paul Ward and uh, firstly the title track of The Last of England. It's interesting that uh, a number of your tunes are inspired by paintings. Yes, indeed. You know, because I think it stems from my childhood because I wanted to, I went to leave school and go to art college. But um, if you've read the biography, you know that was denied me. Mm. And I've always found the paintings have inspired me because I think it's that, that love for art. Yeah, I, I think they're a great source of inspiration. I really do. And he carried on. It mean, started with visionary. It continued with the Peacock Party. And then it was picked up again with The Last of England. Of course, the, the very last album, Scattered Chapters, which we'll, we'll cover in a minute, no doubt. We will. Uh, continued that theme. But I'm glad you chose The Last of England. It's my favourite track on the album. When does the material from that album date from? Because sometimes you do go back and, and find older pieces of yours and dovetail that in with more recent work. Well, that's interesting, yeah, because um, Chatterton, or Elegy, goes back to a tune I wrote in 1973. I remember it being a good tune. I thought, well, I'm going to remember that. So I brought that in, brought that to the table when I was writing writing the, the Brotherhood Suite. It was around about 1987. And... Rick had done his thing on a few of the tracks, but I, I got together with Paul and I said, look, I'd love you to work on these pieces. He said, I don't want to listen to what anybody else has done, he said. I don't want to be influenced by them. And he just worked his magic on those tracks. And the man's a genius. Apart from being a very dear friend, he is a genius.
To close Starfield from Scattered Chapters, do you think that that's a good piece to finish on, Gordon? That's a very, very good piece to finish on, and it's just amazing you've chosen these pieces because they are they are favourites. I want to tell you about Starfield. I can touch on it very briefly. Yeah. I can't tell you the whole story because it becomes very personal. People will think I'm completely potty. <laughs> but the journey with that piece of music was a. Um, my wife and I went out to a, on a to a car boot on a Sunday morning, and I bought a guitar for 20 pounds, a Fender Squire budget guitar, actually, but it sounded great. And I thought, I'd better sort of see what it sounds like. So I took it apart, put it back together again, put some new strings on it, took it into my music room and put it into an open tuning that one would associate with an acoustic piece. In fact, it's the same tuning as a piece called Through Braden's Door. So I put it into that tuning and then I thought, oh, that sounds nice. I wonder it what it would sound like using my on-canvas sounds preset with the delay. So literally, that was the journey. The open tuning, on canvas sounds preset with the delay, and I just started playing, and 20 minutes later, the piece was finished. Gosh. The essence of it. Then I refined it uh, a few days afterwards. But it was just, it just wrote itself. That's going to be reimagined on the four-track vinyl single that comes out, going to come out in December. But we're revisiting Starfield, but... It will have a vocal on it. It's taken it to a new level, a really new, almost like a celestial level. It's absolutely divine. You, when you hear it, you'll love it. So, yes, good choice, that man. Well done. <laughs> and just before we uh, close and uh, end with Starfield, you've mentioned Pete Townsend uh, a few times, and it's definitely worth mentioning your connection with Pete, as well as John Entwistle, and also the fact that uh, you played on... Uh, one of the Who's more recent albums, didn't you, as well? Well, there hangs a tale, my friend, yes. <laughs> in 2019, I got a call from Pete. Do you fancy playing on a track? And I said, yeah, of course I would. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. It was January 2019. I'd gone down to his house, The Wick, on Richmond Hill, went into the studio, put the track down. He loved it. And then when, it, when the, the album was completed, he was in the stage touring, and David Sardi, the producer, completely ditched my so solo. It wasn't used. Oh. Now, it, it says on the album, all guitars on that track, Gordon Gilchrat, but it's not me. It's Pete Townsend. And Pete was absolutely fuming about it. Because, uh, I, I mean, I couldn't tell him because it was it would have sounded like I was complaining. Cause I, what, I was very, I was upset. No, I wasn't upset, actually. I just thought, well, this, these things happen. But we were chatting about it. He said, I don't know about you, Gordon. He said, I can't hear you on the track. I said, that's because I'm not there, Pete. And he said to me, Gordon, he said, if I had my way, he said, I'd love to go back and remix the whole album. But uh, I think there was a, to a degree, the record company wanted a archetypical hmm. rock album. And that's what they got. They got that with uh, with that album. But yeah, at least I got a credit. He, he says I'm not playing the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I'm not on it. I wish I could say I was, but I'm not on it. But from our discussion, um, it's fantastic that, that over the last 20 and 30 years, you've got that recognition as being one of England's great guitarists of your generation. And it's brilliant, the albums that you've been doing with Paul Ward. You're still very active in terms of creating music. And uh, I look forward to some of the releases that are coming uh, later this year as well. 
Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for finding the time. And thank you for being so kind with your praise of me. But at the end of the day, it's only a matter of opinion. And that's fine. I mean, Richie Blackmore, he thinks I'm the best thing to slice bread. And I'll have that. I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> it's only a matter of opinion. But thank you for those dying words. We mentioned earlier, I don't think we mentioned it on air, that we were supposed to get together a few months ago. Yeah. But it fell through the cracks. And the reason for that is you probably know that I lost my dear wife. Yeah, of course. So everything was falling through the cracks, I'm afraid. But um, I'm on a healing journey now. And I'm back. I promised you I would never stop playing. And by God, all the while I can, I will. And I won't break that promise to her. She was very special. She was she was my muse. She was the music. Yeah. And she's left a vast, vast void in my life. But we, we move on. I think the Queen said the price of love is grief. Well, grief is the price of love. You can't have the, you can't have one without the other. It's not possible. And on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Gordon. It's it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye bye.
Thank you for listening to the Strange Brew podcast. If you do like the show, please consider a small donation to help keep the show archive online. It's 10 years since I started the podcast and hosting fees are increasing over time. All your support keeps the show running and helps me get amazing guests. To support me, just go to thestrangebrew.co.uk where you'll see a donate button on the homepage. Thank you very much. Plus, any reviews on your podcast services help to spread the word too. Thank you.